Welcome back to week two of the live painting questioning and answering session here at my studio tonight. So tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to paint live and help uh, answer any questions that you may have. So um, my wife, uh, Emily, is with me once again. She's going to be helping uh, co-host this show for you tonight. So I hope you have some fun. And uh, so this is our way of helping those that are stuck in their home during this time uh, to have a little bit of a uh, hopefully social connection and get out and connect with some other people and see what we're doing during all this mess. So here we go. Let's have some fun tonight. <laughs> okay. So many people say that they could just, you know, they've just drawn all their lives. You, our children certainly use any opportunity they can to draw on walls floors, anything that they can and cannot, really. Um, but when would you say that you started your art career unofficially, and how did you get to where you are now? Uh, I guess my earliest memory of, um, you know, drawing and painting, I started out my, I guess, you know, my brother was an aspiring um, comic book writer, so he would write comics and then I would uh, draw to them and I could always draw well. I had a good eye uh, in terms of how I saw things and the drafting and you know how, how far a line had to be from another and the shape and the proportion. Um, I remember staying up really late in uh, my room. We had this very very tiny uh, bedroom that he and I shared and um, the bunk bed barely fit against the wall and along that bottom edge of it by the foot was a small table. And I would sit up there till sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, probably around age seven or, or eight, uh, just working on creating these fantasy worlds and things. And in grade school, I had a bunch of friends. Uh, they were also, I considered pretty good illustrators at the time. And so we would write comics and then try to sell them uh, in school as well. Um, in terms of other, uh, I guess, uh, inspirations that I had during that time to help propel me and motivate me. Of course, I liked watching uh, PBS with like Bob Ross and there was uh, Commander Mark's Imagination Station. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that, but uh, he would do these cartoons of these space cities and things like that. And he would do it step by step and I found myself being able to follow along very, very well. Um, to that and so I built up this nice little portfolio of that and then also uh, just copying uh, comics I had at the book that I think most uh, aspiring comic book artists have when they're a, a young child starting out is uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way so had that book too so uh, I guess thank my brother for having uh, such a love for comic books and having our bedroom cluttered with these things uh, you, you basically I lived in a nest of uh, comic books and video games as a kid, so that was good inspiration early on. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you were awarded a scholarship to the Savannah College of Art for comic book design? Yeah, early on uh, when I was, I took a year off and um, just for whatever reason, I just didn't care for organized school right away, so I went took a year off, but then I applied down to Savannah College of Art and Design, and I did get a portfolio scholarship to go down there uh, for sequential art. I went as far as actually going down to Savannah, Georgia to check out the school. Um, it was a great, great campus, great school, um, but ultimately just decided to do something uh, different during that time. And for those who may not be familiar, sequential art is comic books? Yeah, that's comic book, uh, storyboard illustration. So sequential being like the panels. So when you see them in sequence, uh, when you read the comic book, that's the sequential part of that. And it may not just be comic book illustration, um, but it can also be things like you may collaborate with uh, movie producers who are also um, looking to put together a story they'll um, have some need for you to put together some panels so they can kind of flush start to flush out their idea and see what that looks like neat hmm. what's your opinion on possibly the most well-known comic of the modern era the walking dead um i actually haven't read the comic uh, myself i just watched the tv show so 
Um, I, I'm one of those guys. I just don't have a lot of time to get into the graphic novel part anymore. Um, I don't. I guess you know, watching the show, I, I've kind of lost interest in it a little bit. But um, I don't know of any cool way that they can end it without it seeming a little hokey at this point. So it'll be interesting to see what they ultimately do with that. Did you ever see the graphic novel? Uh, I believe it was called Mouse. I have. Uh, I know of that, and I was actually fortunate enough to go to the Milwaukee Art uh, Museum, and they had a, a comic book exhibition at that time, so I actually got to see some of the original art of Mouse. Uh, again, didn't really read too much of it. I was more into the visual, the art of it, than the actual stories of a lot of those things, so um, I left the reading and writing to my brother, and I was just more of the visual guy. Uh, but I guess the nice thing, too, at that particular exhibition was they had... Um, uh, Charles Schultz uh, was also the main feature artist there, so you got to see some of the original Peanuts art at the Milwaukee Art Museum, so it was kind of fun to check that all out. Hmm. Nice. Um, and for anyone who may not know, Mouse is a graphic novel, which um, was brought about by the, the artist interviewing his father as his experiences, about his experiences as a Holocaust survivor. So it's... um. You know, it's the story of the Holocaust told by um, the Jews as mice, Germans as cats, and the Poles as pigs. So it's um, not your traditional happy-go-lucky comic, but it is very interesting and, and well-told story. I actually have read it, so <laughs> I've had the opposite experience of Joel. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's opposites attract, so there we go. Yeah. Our... <laughs> yeah. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, so no comments yet, but a lot of people waving. Cool. Hello, everyone. Hello. How's everybody doing? I hope you're okay with the quarantine and uh, everyone's in good health and everything. So far, so good here. Nothing uh, nothing really too exciting to report. Did the grocery shopping thing today and found everything we need. So I'm mm -hmm. um, fortunate with that and hopefully we're coming through the backside of it. But I, I hope to keep doing these. I, I don't mind spending some time with you guys and... Uh, if there's questions that you have, even after this video, um, you can post them in the comment section and I'll get back to you and answer them maybe in next week's video or also online as well. So congratulations everyone for making it through another week. Well right. done. Um, so anyone who is familiar, who has had spent any time with Joel knows that he is a large, not large, big fan of Vincent van Gogh. And Joel, maybe you could tell us what exactly it is that draws you to him and his artwork, because I know it's not just a, uh, an art interest, right? It's also a personal fascination. Yeah, I would say so. There's a lot of similarities between Van Gogh and myself. Um, I guess I, I find that, you know, obviously the name, uh, his fellow countryman, Dutchman, um, uh, his father was a minister, my father was a minister, his uh, dad was Theodorus, mine was Theodore, just um, very interesting there. I think one of the most fascinating things about uh, his story is that struggle between trying, is trying to find your place in the world. Uh, we all have you know, things that we do and then ultimately you stumble upon, if you're lucky, uh, you will stumble upon your vocation. I made a quick video about that this week. Um, I think we all have something that we're truly supposed to do uh, here in the world. And then some people spend a lifetime trying to find that. I think of somebody like, um, if you're familiar with the artists, like Grandma Moses, she didn't find painting until she was uh, 80 plus and then became a, a famous painter. But um, I, I like his uh, approach to, he was really one of the first artists to um, take you know, emotional um, turmoil and transcribe that onto the canvas. Prior to that, it was very uh, technical and very tight and precise and coming out during that Impressionist era, he even went above and beyond what the Impressionists were doing to try to tie in um, that emotional aspect to it too. But I really think that it's about, the, the, the affinity for the story is that it's about the perpetual struggle um, of trying to find your purpose and then also ultimately trying to be successful within that as well. What is your favorite piece of his? Um, that's a good question. There's quite a bit. I would say... No, top one right now. Let's go. Top one. Um, <laughs> first thing that popped into my mind, I'd say it would probably be uh, Wheatfield with Crows because that's uh, 
allegedly one of his last works, and I think it's a culmination of everything that he ever did. And if you look at the piece, it can either be, uh, you know, there's crows coming up out of the wheat field, so they can either be, you know, uh, a symbol of uh, trouble coming to you in terms of the darkness of the crow, or it could also be the other way around, the way that it's composed, that the, the crows could also be leaving the scene, you know, demons gone, that kind of thing as well. In your unprofessional, biased opinion, was he shot? Um, my personal opinion is that I don't believe that he shot himself. I think that uh, he may, if he did, uh, he may have brought a pistol with him, but he, they said that he never uh, owned one, so that would be interesting as to where uh, he might have gotten one because no one ever recalled him having one. I think he might have brought it with him if he did own one to possibly scare the birds by firing off around so it would come up out of those fields so he could capture that um, image in his mind to paint. Uh, but there were also known to be some boys uh, in his town that would follow him and kind of tease him and, and chase him around and they may have shot him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the most odd thing was that when he uh, returned back to his room, he didn't have any of his art materials with him and none were ever found. So he was out painting, where did those materials end up? Who knows, right? So it's very mm -hmm. highly suspicious that if he were in a set area and he said where that may have happened, that somebody might have gone out there and said, hey, let me go get your stuff for you, but there was nothing ever found, which is also kind of adds to that mystery. Hmm. The world may never know. <laughs> you have a hello from Nancy. Oh, hi, Nancy. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hope everybody's doing well on your side of the world. <laughs> yep. Who are your favorite modern artists? Modern, like contemporary, not like modern in the Van Gogh sense, which is very loosely modern in the history of the world. Right, gotcha. Yeah, probably a bunch of people that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> so um, that's kind of one of the unfortunate things in the art world is a lot of names aren't known until after you're no longer around. So I would say right now, I'd like, uh, I've always liked uh, stuff by like Jeremy Mann. Uh, right now online, I like uh, seeing like, uh, Edward Minoff's work is pretty nice at this point. Uh, Jacob Pfeiffer uh, with a PH, uh, PH, or PF, sorry, PF uh, Pfeiffer. Um, I like his stuff a lot um, for his, he's doing more of that realism type stuff. I'm kind of in that mode right now too. So it's just three, uh, but there's a whole bunch uh, of different artists that I really like right now, but I could rattle off a bunch of names that no one ever <laughs> knew of. So yeah, but those are some guys that I, that I really like their work right now. Oh, thank you, Nancy. So she said that it's a beautiful painting. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I just started this a few nights ago. Um, in my other videos, you may have seen me set up. I talked about setting up the um, the light box and also this comp composition as well. Uh, I'm particularly enjoying uh, this transition between uh, this green and the black. I think it's just so dramatic. You have this like neon green of the apple uh, coming up against the black. And um, had a vision last night of maybe doing... Um, some type of daffodil or yellow flower in the next arrangement because I see how that plays against that black. We may see something like that definitely in the future because I know that your dreams are very prophetic to you. Um, whereas me, I just, whatever, I can't even remember them most of the time, <laughs> but you always have very clear and very vivid dreams. Um, ever had any art related dreams? Uh, it's very strange. Actually, I don't really have too many dreams of, uh, you know, painting or doing anything like that. I guess, uh, it may, I guess tie together in terms of it being some type of, uh, psychological, uh, you know, state that you enter when you paint, you're kind of, I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing right now. Uh, just a little bit. I'm at that point. I've been painting for so long that. I do about 20% of the work and the, the muse, I guess you would call it, is doing the other 80% uh, of the work and the materials are kind of just doing their own thing. So um, in terms of like you know, dreams, uh, some artists, you know, they keep a book by their bed and then they write things down and they come out and then they interpret it. Uh, I never really got too much into the like um, surreal or metaphysical in terms of my art. I've always been 
more of a literal realist painter. I paint um, things that I see and that I experience, but I guess somewhere along the line it has to be some of it that gets uh, translated from what you dream and experience in the subconscious to the conscious reality, I think would have to come through at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here on this painting, I'm just kind of working with, I'm starting to put in the design of the fabric. It doesn't have to be too detailed. I just kind of want to punch in a few things here and there and I'll adjust these values and stuff. I'm basically just punching in shapes at this point to kind of represent the pattern of this fabric and this cloth. Um, you know, it's really about suggesting the pattern. You don't have to sit there and paint every little design and everything because when you're with a painting, I am this close to it. I'm about a foot away, foot and a half away. But most people, when you go see this on a wall, are going to be five, six, seven feet away. So if I can get it mm -hmm. looking pretty accurate here, when you're six, seven, eight feet away, it's going to look uh, very, very accurate. But it's very rare for somebody to be this close uh, to a painting. So sometimes that can mess with artists too, as you sit there and you start to worry about every little nuance and every little detail. But in reality, no one's ever going to get this close to the painting. So if you can get it kind of just a representation, sometimes it's a good idea when you're painting to step up and take a step back and look at it because that's really how the majority of your audience is going to be viewing the painting. <laughs> your last painting that you showed us, I think a week ago, featured a limited palette. Is that what you are working with again? Yeah, this is still a limited palette. And so what Emily uh, means by that is I'm only using... Um, I guess I would call it five colors. So I use uh, uh, pyrrole red, which is a true red red um, on the color spectrum. They number, when you look at pigments and color in paint, they actually will number them. So you can go in and it might be like R, there might be uh, like R240 or R244. You can see what direction the paint is going. It's either gonna have more yellow in it or it's gonna have more blue in it uh, within those, the number scale. So I use pyrrole red, um, which is a true red, uh, cadmium yellow, which is a true, true yellow, um, ultramarine blue, ivory black, and then titanium white. And from there you can make just about any color. And what I find too is because those colors are so true and so pure, a lot of times when you get a pre-mixed color uh, in a tube at the store, it's gonna have different tones in it which could influence the direction that you want it to go. And what I mean by that is you might buy a pre-made tube of, say, this green. Well, that clearly has a lot of yellow in it. But if I go in and I make that green, I can um, move the yellow or blue value within the green as I see fit to try to get this different tone. So it allows you to control and manipulate the color more easily because it is a base true color that you're starting with. So you can go uh, back or forth with that within... Uh, the color wheel, not to get too spec uh, technical and crazy on you guys, but that's what I've enjoyed about it. Sometimes you'll also see uh, people working with um, limited palette. They might use uh, burnt umber, which is a dark brown, or they might use uh, burnt sienna, which is kind of a reddish uh, brown. But I, I feel like, you know, like in this area, this painting, I was able to achieve uh, those colors just specifically with um, ivory black and a little bit of red and just the, the very slightest drop of yellow um, in there. Um, the black is actually going to have a blue in it also. So you're gonna create a little bit of a purplish tone because the, the black tube paint that you get does have a little bit of blue uh, hue in it also. On a side note, if I could recommend, if you're bored, if you're on Instagram, Williamsburg Paints has videos of paints being mixed and it is absolutely mesmerizing and the paints are so vibrant and if you're like me you could just sit there and watch it all day because it just is awesome. Um, hello Nancy, you're very engaged tonight, thank you. She says my granddaughter paints well for the age of 10 but you are awesome. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I would say just keep encouraging it. I, I, in one of my other videos too I talked about how we're all artists as children and you know the art is something that is uh, you know proverbial so when we're a child we don't necessarily have the words to express what's on our mind so we might put it into art so um, you can see a lot in a child's art in terms of you know, subconscious if you start really looking at it analyzing it 
Um, but uh, a lot of times what will happen is as we get older, we give up that visual representation of what we're trying to express in favor of words. As we learn our vocabulary, uh, people then begin to hang up that uh, willingness, I guess, early on when they're, as their child, everybody paints, everybody draws, everybody creates stuff, but somewhere along the line we lose it, uh, where some other people keep it and hang on to it. So if she's doing that now at age 10, I would say, you know, encourage that, because if that's not encouraged, it may be something that um, she ultimately just decides not to do, because it's just not something that is getting any type of response from anybody. Um, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, family uh, that also encouraged me to do what I was doing. So there was always, you know, a new scrapbook or a new um, sketchbook coming home from dad or a set of paints or things like that. So they were very encouraging of that early on. So that was very helpful, I would think. <laughs> Side note, parenting tip. One of the things that I learned was, or anyone who's around children really, if they show you a piece of art and you're not really sure what it is, instead of just making an assumption like, oh, is that an elephant? Well, no, it's my mom. Hmm. Um, you could kind of just a blank slate, just say, oh my gosh, it's great. Tell me all about it. Tell me everything. What is this? What is that? So that way you're not making an assumption. You're not insulting what they've done because obviously they think that it looks exactly like their mom or whomever, you know? So it's just a way to keep that dialogue open and kind of keep that encouragement going for them. So. Yeah, and uh, it reminds me, I was actually talking to a friend today online about it. Um, you know, Picasso once said, it took me five years to learn to paint like an old master, but a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. So mm -hmm. um, there's something that's just so raw and so unique mm -hmm. uh, in, in kid art that you just, it, it's almost impossible to try to make it. A few people can, you know, as an adult, but there's something that you lose along the way where I guess there's a fear of, you know, somewhere like, you know, somebody's going to be judging this, but when you're a child, you know, you don't have any of that. You're just making art to make art. And in my experience, um, when I've done things like that, where I've just made art to make art, where I don't really care, uh, I think it's been some of my better uh, work. Like this year, I'm just doing this for the sake of doing it. Um, this isn't sold or anything like that. It's just something I'm doing to do. Um, shout out to Joshua Lawson. He says, hi, cousin. Oh, yeah. Josh is my cousin from uh, Pennsylvania. So thanks for joining us, Josh. I hope the family's doing well out there, too, and everything. So uh, what I'm doing when I'm working on this painting, um, I'm trying to set some of the, the darks and the lights, and I'm working towards the middle in this particular painting. You can go... Uh, dark to light is much easier than trying to go light to dark. Uh, for some reason, oil paints work really well when you're uh, going darker to light. It's kind of a reverse thought of like when you paint a room. A lot of people say, well, geez, if I painted this room black walls and I want to make it white again, I have to take uh, so many different layers of paint. You don't run into that problem as much in oil paint for some reason. Um, so one method that's very, very common is trying to work um, that dark to light um, approach to it. Um, you can also do uh, light to dark. I've seen that. Uh, I find personally um, for me that it's better to go middle out both directions. So, um, And I jump around a lot because what will happen too, if you're painting this painting, you start in this corner and we're to work your way across this way without jumping around. By the time you got down to this corner, it's going to be completely disconnected and you know the color harmony is not going to work together if you jump around you're going to have some of that paint on your brush that's already loaded in there from here from here from here uh, i pretty much use a single brush so, and i will get smaller and smaller with my brush as i go along so um, i'll know the painting is getting close to being done or done when i, I have a, a teeny tiny brush out there and i'm just <laughs> plopping in the highlight on the apple that's the last step i want to do so these will actually have um, some white sheen to it, but I don't want to get into that white too much because you got to be very, very careful with the white too, because it'll ghost out these colors. And if you put too much white in, it's going to look milky and chalky and, and try to mess with that. So, um, I will put a very little bit in here and there, but it's, it's such a powerful color or lack of color that you have to be really careful with how you approach that. 
Uh, the lag on this is horrible. We have another uh, comment from Nancy. She said that regarding her granddaughter, she got the talent from her grandfather's side of the family. Even her mother paints too. I'm not that talented. And I feel you, Nancy. Try being married to this guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, some things that I've been looking at that I find very, very fascinating is how how do some people, you know, get that in their family? People will say, you know, okay, well, he's a third generation this or that. Um, one thing that's really interesting, if you want to get into some things and geek out about some of this, is something called epigenetics, and that's uh, DNA memory. So um, that's kind of like, you know, how a spider knows how to weave a web or a bee knows how to make a hive. They just know how to do that. And it definitely seems that some uh, people and some cultures uh, do things a little bit, uh, I guess, better than some others. I mean, I think of, uh, you know, all the great uh, Italian artists, the, the carvings, like, uh, you know, your Michelangelo type that they do these wonderful marble sculptures, uh, great fashion design. Uh, the French are generally great bakers. So I wonder if somewhere in your DNA, you remember uh, what your ancestors might have done a long time ago and it just gets passed along to you and it's just somewhere in there. So, you know, maybe your granddaughter hasn't been painting for just 10 years. Maybe it's a culmination of 250 years of family members that came before that's somewhere in her DNA. So that's some very interesting thing, but that's, you can get really deep on that stuff and go down that rabbit hole. It's, it's called epigenetics. And that's a really interesting uh, thing to take a look at and see. Um, there should be some more study in that because I think that that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a comment from Stacy. She said, I'm sorry. I'm sad that I caught this so far into it. I'm going to save and watch tomorrow. Thank you for doing this, uh, both of you. Amazing talent. So thank you, Stacy. And um, Linda says, beautiful painting. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, it'll be up on my YouTube channel, too. I'll post a link to that. So if uh, you missed the beginning, uh, I'll clean this up in, in, in post-production. I sound so official. <laughs> I'll clean this up in post, and then um, I can add some different things to it, too. So... Uh, if you haven't checked out the YouTube video or this is you're watching it on YouTube um, I have put up some other videos. I'm trying to do something every day or two or three now um, Could be anything just thoughts on my mind. Maybe it's a particular lesson or technique or something that I'm working on um, I've also started to review some of my paintings to go over them to talk to you about um, my thought process on creating them and I'm also going to be doing some of my other uh, artists that I know and that I enjoy as well so if uh, there's someone that you think that would benefit from me reviewing their art uh, definitely send me some information about them i'd love to get their name and take a look at that and i'd be happy to put together some things with their permission and talk about their painting as well may i make a recommendation sure you can make a recommendation okay um just <laughs> <No>. because <laughs> just because we've actually met and i do enjoy his work and he's a lovely person um can we look into john bonner's work yeah, that's a good point. I should connect with John and see what he's doing. Uh, uh, John's another local artist. I believe he's in uh, Marblehead, Mass. He's based out of, so it's Anthony John Bonner. If you um, haven't, uh, go ahead and check out his work. Um, super cool work and very, very nice uh, individual. I've had the pleasure of meeting him at one of his uh, later gallery openings in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, about last year. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, nice to see him and uh, very good work, but yes, I uh, appreciate the suggestion. So we'll take a look at that, see if that was something he would be interested in doing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pat says, you are really great. Thanks for sharing. Oh, thanks, Pat. Appreciate that. Uh, kind words and things from my, uh, I guess, fans, you know, keep me going and stuff. So sometimes you just uh, think, what am I doing this mm -hmm. for? But, uh, so I appreciate anytime anybody uh, comments or shares or or likes this thing or just gives me any time spending with me and uh, it's very uh, flattering. I'm always humbled by it because it was just something that, you know, here I was, this uh, guy just trapped in his room just doing this stuff and trying to work through some things mentally and got into painting that way uh, when my mother got sick. So uh, that was kind of the catalyst that started me painting on. She uh, passed of Alzheimer's in 2010 and I just took to the painting to try to be a cathartic release for that so I could mentally, I guess, occupy myself uh, 
instead of dealing with anything else that I had to deal with in the world at that time. Okay. Well, sorry for every, to everyone for making the screen jump now and then. Um, it's a Friday night at nine o'clock. I'm not sure what else you can expect from me. Hmm. Um, but it is nine o'clock and that's when you asked for a heads up on time. Okay. So up to you. Yeah, I think we're going to wrap it there, you guys. Um, I will be back next week. Again, you can check out the YouTube channel. I'll post a link on this video for that. Uh, you can like uh, and subscribe to that so you get notifications. Uh, it'll either pop up if you got the app or send an email when I do post a new video. Uh, I do appreciate your time as always. So if you um, have any questions, again, about anything we talked about, painting in general, or something that just comes to your mind and you want to ask, be sure to comment that. Uh, and I will definitely um, respond to you either by text or in the next video as well. We do plan on being back next Friday night also from 8.30 Eastern until 9. So thank you for that. I hope everybody remains safe and I hope you enjoy this. And one last comment sliding in under the wire. Right. Jonathan says, love this exclamation, exclamation. All right. Thanks, We're, Jonathan. Way great. to end on a high note. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We'll see you guys next week. Be safe. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for notifications of future videos. If you have a question about art or this video, please be sure to leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Happy painting and God bless.